A few months ago, the coronavirus was a localized outbreak in Wuhan, China. Today, COVID-19 has exploded into a global pandemic that has governments worldwide placing their countries under lockdown. Hello, I'm Lina Mudu. Welcome to a special edition of Straight Talk Africa on the coronavirus. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic is posing a global challenge never seen before in this century as health authorities around the world are grappling to contain the outbreak. Confirmed cases of the virus have surpassed 1.3 million globally, and more than 73,000 have died from the viral disease. Now the good news, over 270,000 people have recovered. In Africa, COVID-19 has infected at least 9,000 people. More than 400 have lost their lives to the virus, but over 900 have survived. So far, Africa has the world's lowest burden of COVID-19 cases, but the virus is showing no signs of slowing down. As the coronavirus spreads, so do myths and misinformation. Today, our experts will address some of them and answer your questions. But first, countries across the continent have imposed a wide range of measures to prevent the spread of the coronavirus, including closing schools, imposing travel restrictions and curfews. Straight Talk Africa's Paul Ndio has the details. Most of the world knew little about COVID-19 last December, when reports of a new deadly virus started to surface in Wuhan, China. Since then, however, it has spread across the world, disrupting daily lives of millions of people. Many of them are now under lockdown measures, meant to slow the spread of the virus. The highly contagious coronavirus is now threatening to spread across Africa. Dr. Amita Taka is the chairperson of the Nairobi-based Africa Health Business. He says Africa requires a united approach to fight COVID-19. I think everyone, government, private sector, civil society, development partners are all on the forefront and preparing to ensure that we flatten the curve. As you know, the ability of our health systems is even weaker than many of the countries that have faced um, high levels of uh, mortality. The World Health Organization says the impact of a major epidemic across Africa could be devastating. Most of the continent's healthcare systems are still ill-equipped to care for what could be an overwhelming number. We should scale up our preparedness. But let's look at Kenya, for example, where I am. Our president and the Minister of Health uh, leading the government efforts are totally on the ball about what's happening of cor on corona. The private sector has regrouped itself in an organized manner to provide the support it needs. Uh, there are measures being taken to try and prevent transmission. As you know, in Africa right now, we are focusing on the big three goals. The first goal is prevent transmission. The second goal is prevent death. And the third one is preventing social harm. All our activities are geared towards these three goals. COVID-19 has killed tens of thousands of people, according to Johns Hopkins Medical Center. But over 270,000 people have recovered from the disease. Dr. Laura Tani Rimak, a family physician based in Saskatchewan, Canada, says Africa is still ground zero, even though medical professionals and governments are doing their best. So there are three steps. It's testing. It is also having access to the result. And then if you have it, you have to be staged in terms of severity and treated. But also if you don't have it, we want to prevent you having it. Or if you have mild symptoms, then you also have to, to be socially isolated to prevent its spread. Dr. Tanya Rimak warns that Africans need to change their mindset. That this virus is aggressive. Uh, it is a killer. It is a paradigm shift. It is not about panic. It is about calming down to realize that this virus is it travels in the air, this air that we all breathe. Many countries are facing a severe shortage of masks and other personal protective equipment. 
as the coronavirus infects more people and claims more lives. Social media outlets are teaming up with countries on the continent to fight the misinformation about COVID-19 on social media platforms. Paul Ndiho, VOA News. Now I'm pleased to introduce our guests. From Durban, South Africa, we are joined by Dr. Salim Abdul Karim, epidemiologist and director of the Center for the AIDS Program of Research in South Africa, CAPRISA. From New York City, we are joined by Dr. Sion Firu, Doctor of Emergency Medicine and advisor to Ethiopia's Minister of Health on Emergency Care and Strategic Partnership. In Abuja, in Nigeria, we have Dr. Ibrahim Abubakar Kana, Director and National Program Manager for Saving One Million Lives Program for Results, a World Bank funded project in Nigeria's Federal Ministry of Health. Also joining us today from Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso, is Dr. Mumuni Nyaone, Executive Director of Pool for Progress Burkina Faso, and also Behavioral Social Health Specialist. A warm welcome to you all for joining us on this special edition of Street Talk Africa. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and uh, to you, our viewers, you can join the conversation on social media with the hashtag VOA Coronavirus Africa. Dr. Karim, let me start with you. Uh, South Africa currently has the highest rate of uh, coronavirus infection in Africa. Can you give us a quick overview of uh, where things stand currently? Sure. The first case of the coronavirus infection uh, was detected in South Africa just about a month ago on the 5th of March. It grew initially very slowly but we reached about 100 cases in just over a week. And since then, it has grown quite rapidly. In the last few days, the numbers of new cases have steadily declined. And that's largely a function of the first epidemic, which was mainly among travelers. So most of the cases we have now, it's just under 1,700 cases were among those who traveled overseas and came back positive, and then some of their contacts. Okay. But over the last few days, we've now seen community transmission. So the virus is now transmitting at a community level, and we expect to see those cases in the next wave. Very important point. We went from travel uh, infection to community transmission, and we'll talk more about that uh, during the discussion. Now to you, Dr. Tsion. You are a special advisor to Ethiopia's uh, Minister of Health. What is the current situation of the COVID-19 outbreak in Ethiopia? Okay. So in Ethiopia, we, uh, our first case was on March 13, and in the past, uh, I guess, three and a half weeks now, Total cases of this morning is 52 cases, and we've had two deaths so far. Um, <clears throat> one thing I would say is Ethiopia has established um, the Emergency Operations Center, activ uh, activated the Emergency Operations Center as of January 27, because Ethiopia was identified as a high-risk country because um, it's an international hub. Flights continue to other parts of China, and also lots of traffic to the airport. So the um, the screening at the airports were very vigilant from the very beginning. And now, so as of a week and two, almost two weeks ago, the government issued that any traveler that comes from abroad should be quarantined in a hotel. So the few cases that we've seen in the past uh, few days are from people that have arrived in the past two weeks and that are on quarantine at this hotel. Okay. So we've been able to detect a lot of travelers coming from abroad where they're already contained inside a hotel and they'll be monitored for 14 days from arrival. All right, and we'll see more uh, what measures are being put in place uh, in Ethiopia. Now to you, Dr. Kana. Nigeria was the first country in sub-Saharan Africa to have a case of COVID-19. What is the latest on the outbreak in your country? Uh, thank you very much. Um, as I yesterday night, 9.30 p.m., Nigeria actually recorded 238 cases, uh, out of which, um, as of that yesterday also, we have discharged about uh, actually 35 patients. And um, Nigeria has recorded so far five deaths. Uh, incidentally, most of the, over 60% of the cases recorded in Nigeria are actually patients or rather travelers that came into the country. 
I must quickly say here that the first recorded case in Nigeria was actually an Italian who actually worked in the country. And then um, he came in through Lagos Airport. And um, he traveled down to a state called Ogun State, which is the state, neighboring state to uh, Lagos State. But you see, government was very proactive at that time, you know, to quickly address or rather to track all the contacts that the, the first in this case actually made. That actually helped us greatly. Again, we are coming from Ebola. If you recall, Nigeria did very well in the control of Ebola. Even when most of the people around the world felt Nigeria would not be able to control Ebola, but we brought Ebola to its knees and we controlled Ebola within a short period of time. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely see uh, the lessons learned from Ebola, and this is something that we, we will, will touch on, uh, Dr. Kana. Now, let's go to Dr. Nyaone in Burkina Faso. Your country recorded the first death of COVID-19 in sub-Saharan Africa on March 18. Give us a sense of where the country is with the coronavirus outbreak as, as of now. Okay, so uh, right now we have uh, three... 364 cases with 18 uh, people who died from coronavirus, and we have 108 people who recovered from the disease. And the first case uh, came in the in March, the 9th of March, and it started with uh, some travelers and the government officials and some diplomatic officials in the country. So this is what we have in okay. Burkina so far. So we clearly see a common uh, thread here is that uh, the first cases in Africa, uh, or sub-Saharan Africa in particular, were related to travelers coming from uh, abroad, especially from Europe. There's a lot that we do not know about uh, COVID-19 coronavirus, and we'll try to have more understanding today. Uh, our viewers uh, as well have many, many questions, and many of you sent us your video questions, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. Let's begin with a question from Zimbabwe. At what stage can you tell that you have the disease? How long does it take for you to get sick after you are infected? And uh, Dr. Karim, let me uh, give you this question. Uh, at what stage do, do you know that uh, you are infected with coronavirus? Uh, talk to us a little bit about the infection. So given that this, we didn't know this virus existed uh, before 19th of December, the information and the knowledge we've had is really from the last few months, and most of it is thanks to the detailed research from our colleagues in China. And what we do know is from the date on which a person gets infected, the symptoms appear about a week later, somewhere in the order of seven to 10 days. The symptoms that are most common are an upper respiratory tract infection. So it's things like fever, which is the most common, cough, sore throat. So uh, when you're looking at a patient who's presenting with this, you can work on the basis that roughly the infection occurred just over a week ago. Mm -hmm. And um, at what stage uh, does one need to uh, report to the hospital if uh, uh, they see that the symptoms maybe increase? Because we hear reports where people can stay home uh, and take care of themselves and then report to the hospital. So what is the case then? Uh, let me uh, give you this question, Dr. Sion. Would you enlighten us? Okay. So I think it depends on the resources that you have. Um, and depends on the number of the cases that you have in the country and what your Ministry of Health or what the country is doing. So my experience from uh, for the Ethiopian cases have been that if people are quote-unquote high risk, meaning having traveled or exposure with a known COVID-19 or in the areas where we see in the community spread, people would have to call the number, the number that's provided from the Ministry of Health when they develop symptoms. So the, then eventually they will get tested uh, if they meet the criteria based on what um, my colleague had described, where things are changing by the day based on the experiments and based on the studies that are coming up. But again, it depends on what you, the recommendation from each country. Okay. So I think most of the African countries are doing that where they've isolated or put people inside healthcare institutes. But 
uh, just to share my experience here in New York, where we have cases in the city over 60,000 as of today, anybody with mild symptoms is told to stay home because um, we just don't have the capacity to put them in the hospital. But I think in areas where they're trying to flatten the curve and the resources are limited and we're trying to spread the, trying to stop the spread, if anybody's concerned about COVID, they have to call the right number and get the directions from their Department of Health or from their Ministries of Health. Okay. Uh, now let's go to another question from a viewer in Kenya. How is the coronavirus different from other viruses like flu and others? Yes, let's talk uh, about uh, the coronavirus and how it differs from the flu and uh, some of the similarities. And again, Dr. Karim, let me come to you. Uh, can you enlighten us uh, with regards to these two diseases? Sure. So when we look at influenza, we are very used to getting influenza being spread in the communities every winter. It's something we have gotten used to, and every year we get a flu strain coming around. There's quite a big difference between influenza and the coronavirus. So firstly, they're completely different viruses, but also the clinical features of influenza are much more severe than they are with the coronavirus. However, the big difference is that because many of us have had flu in the past, we often have protection against the strain that is occurring. Also, we have a vaccine. So if you take the vaccine that's protective against the strain, then you are not likely to get infected. So we have measures to protect ourselves, either past infection, in other words, natural immunity, or we have vaccination. With the coronavirus, we've never experienced this virus before. Humanity has never seen this. So every one of us is at risk. There's a second big difference, and that is that the influenza, the rate at which it spreads, is that for every person who is infected, that person will infect, on average, one other. With the coronavirus, every person that's infected will infect two to three other people. It's something called the reproductive rate of infection. But what does that mean in reality? It means that with the coronavirus, if you have 10,000 people infected today, within two to three days, that number will treble. So it'll become 30,000. Within another two to three days, you get 90,000 because you're multiplying by close to three. So that means you can go from a small number to a very large number of people infected in a very short space of time. And so that's what causes this very high numbers of infection. And what happens as a result? we know that about 5% of them are going to need severe medical, serious medical care, including, to some extent, ventilation. So it happens that all of these patients are coming then to the healthcare system about a week later. All of them needing medical care, and the healthcare system just can't deal with it. And so the healthcare system just simply collapses, and people start dying because we don't have enough ICU care, we don't have enough ventilators. So okay. that's the big difference. Okay. And uh, Dr. Kana, let me come to you and ask, what is uh, the, the case? I know you gave us uh, kind of an overview of what's happening in Nigeria. But uh, as of today, how is the healthcare system able to assist those who are infected with COVID-19? I think what, what the government did from the outset is um, setting up what, a presidential task force. And, um, and then the next thing the president did was also to meet with all the governors. We have 36 plus one states in Nigeria. And each of those states actually, to that extent, are actually independent of one another. You know, therefore, government now set out the criteria for managing the coronavirus in each of the states of the federation. Number one, Government, federal government now asks each of the states to set up a state task team. What it means is that each state must have an emergency operation center to respond to any emergencies as regards coronavirus. One. Secondly, what government did also is to ensure that each state of the federation actually establishes one isolation center of at least minimum 300 beds. There are some states which are bigger and therefore they can have a larger number of facilities. You know, but the minimum is 300 beds per state. Thirdly, the government has put in place a system, a supply chain system, whereby 
consumables, i.e. the PPE, face masks, and the rest of them were made available to all the states of the Federation. But the most important, besides the issue of um, uh, case finding, the next is you have to test. Now, what government did immediately is to reactivate and make functional at least six laboratories in the country. Because without testing, there's simply no way you can actually address the issue of corona in the country. Therefore, that's what Nigeria has done so far. And that's what has been helping us. The different parts of the country, laboratories are functional now. And for each case that we found, we do an immediate contact tracing. Now, this work is currently coordinated by the Nigerian Centers for Disease Control. Incidentally, this is a center that is new, but quite frankly, doing extremely well in this response. Okay. Making sure that they have a team on ground that can actually be dispatched to any state to provide just not just technical assistance, but to ensure that things are actually working well in each of those states of the federation. Uh, and okay. that's why even in Lagos, we are doing very well in the control in Lagos at the moment. And contact tracing is very, very important indeed in, in this situation. Uh, Dr. Nyaone, let me come to you. Uh, talk to us about, as a, a community health specialist, do you have a sense that communities are really uh, grasping the importance of this uh, disease? Because there were issues where people were not taking this seriously. Sometimes they thought that the disease was something that was uh, for the West. Uh, how are communities reacting to this uh, COVID-19? So, yes, you know, that's uh, one of the biggest challenge we have in Africa. People still think that... Uh, COVID-19 is from Western, that white people are more vulnerable about like to COVID. And in Burkina, for example, the disease started from people who traveled. So we see them, the community see them as, uh, you know, uh, rich people. And uh, the first cases you saw, you, can, you could see people from the government. So it comforts people who think, uh, who, uh, who, who think that, yes, uh, co coronavirus is just for rich people. So in our community, people still don't take it serious. They think it's just lie, and uh, they think it's the different barriers they should uh, have, the different behavior they have to, to take to prevent the disease are too hard to follow. And uh, yes, so they don't think it's uh, something serious so far. Okay. This is a challenge. So and how I do you address this challenge? With, uh, drawing from your experience, how do you convince communities to, to understand what the problem is and also to be part of the solution? So uh, the... Uh, as I said, it's uh, all about communication. And uh, from my, uh, our NGO, we are trying to get volunteers to talk to the community. So the volunteers will come, uh, come from the community and by training them about coronavirus and the right, giving, by giving them the right information, they are able to use the, the messages from their own perspective to convince people that coronavirus is something serious. And uh, I think the government of Burkina should do better in presenting the cases. You know, when you see the statistics, they only say 364 people are sick. So from the perspective of people uh, in rural areas, it's just figures. Yeah. But if they start giving more details, I don't say they should say the name of people, but by saying among the, those 364 people, uh, like 200 are uh, like or 20 people are healthcare workers. Yes. Uh, 100 people are from this perspective. Like, yeah. So, I mean, if we have more details, it will convince the community. So it's really about uh, to... framing the message in a way that communities understand. And uh, it's very exactly. important. It's very, very important. Let's go to another question. And this one is from Ethiopia. Uh, the first question would be actually uh, regarding with uh, the atmosphere that the virus actually relays on. Uh, I mean, how long does the virus stay uh, in, on the surface? particularly in Africa. 
Dr. Salim, how long does the virus stays on surface, whether it's cardboard, steel, uh, you know, iron, or even cloth? Do we have uh, some uh, specific and firm information on this? Yes, we do. So a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine about just about two weeks ago, they did a study of how long does the virus survive on all different kinds of surfaces. So it survives for a very short time on cardboard and paper in the order of eight hours, 10 hours, and that sort of order. It survives longer on plastic and it survives longest on hard surfaces like stainless steel. So they showed that on stainless steel, the virus is still viable three days later. So that's why we're very concerned in particular that when you're dealing with surfaces like stainless steel or steel or iron, you can expect that the virus will, that the, those items will be contaminated and can transmit the virus up to three to four days later. All right. Dr. Uh, Sion, let me ask you this. Uh, you work in the U.S., a country with the highest numbers currently in the world, and then the city of New York, the city with the highest number uh, in, in the country. What is your day like when you get to the hospital, briefly? What can you tell us? Okay, so just to give a bit of a context, uh, about five weeks ago, we had only a handful of cases, and the first case was about a month and a half almost. And in the past, and then the following two weeks right afterwards, the case just um, grew exponentially to thousands of cases. As of today, New York has over 60,000 cases. And the amount of stress, the amount of constraint that has put on the system is uh, beyond what I could explain. When I walk into my emergency department, uh, before I walk into the emergency department, it's like the streets have changed into an emergency room. We have a tent outside taking care of the mild symptoms. And when you walk into the waiting room, which any other time would have been a waiting room, is now an emergency room where you see patients uh, coughing, complaints of fever, and headache. And our emergency rooms now feel like ICUs because when you walk into the emergency department, you see a lot of patients on a ventilator because they're unable to breathe on their own or there are severe respiratory distress from this. So it's almost uh, stretchers and on the hallway um, and shoulder to shoulder with every, lots of patients, lots of people, providers. We have not allowed family members to be in the hospital during this peak season here. And we're witnessing um, unprecedented amount of death, meaning our morgues are full so now we have to put bodies inside a refrigerated truck. And this is the case in almost every hospital. And the sad thing is the government, the governor announced yesterday that we're running out of burial spaces that would have to start using park spaces for burials. So as a person who practices in a high income country and also knows the issues in, in um, most of the sub-Saharan Africa, I never thought I would witness things things like this in the U.S. where we have, where we presume to have lots of resources and also the right amount of human resources as well. So it's just been uh, mind-blowing to witness this in this country yeah. and to have shortages of supplies and to continue to have now shortages of medicine. So it's been overwhelming for everyone in healthcare profession in the U.S. in the past few weeks. Overwhelming indeed. Uh, Dr. Kana, talk to us about uh, the situation of healthcare workers uh, in Nigeria. It's a global problem, access to equipment, access to protective gears. Uh, we've seen it in developed countries. What is the situation in Nigeria? Well, certainly, you know, Nigeria cannot be different from most parts of the world. If America, most parts of Europe are complaining about equipment, consumables, certainly Nigeria is equally facing the same situation. And that's, but the luck we have at the moment is that, yes, we've taken an inventory of all the equipment that we have in Nigeria, i.e. ventilators, and of course the testing uh, materials as well. We are far short of what we require, considering a population of 200 million. But the luck we have at the moment is that, in as much as we are still mostly resources from around the world, including from the United States, including from China, and most parts of the world that actually produce this equipment, we are sincerely grateful to God Almighty that the cases in Nigeria are still within manageable limits. 
Most importantly, of the 238 cases that we've had so far and the five deaths, actually none actually required serious um, uh, ventilation. You know, so, so it has helped us. But that's not to say that we have enough equipment or consumables. Now, moving forward, this has actually brought to fore the reality that we have to actually strengthen our system. In terms of human resources, we have enormous number of doctors, nurses, and paramedics in the country. What government is doing right now is to get ready for the worst case scenario. Absolutely. So what the Minister of Health has done now is to ensure that he mobilizes the existing healthcare workers, that's number one, those that are under the employment of government. Number two, those that are in the private sector and the military. Now, these are the ones that are being mobilized now. And thirdly, the ones that are even unemployed or those that are retired. Okay. What government is doing now is working with the medical associations to ensure that these numbers of people or personnel that are outside are actually taken into consideration and brought together while waiting for any eventuality. While okay. praying to God Almighty so all, ha that all, all hands on number. deck. All hands on deck. Okay, Absolutely. Dr. Kana, Absolutely. we'll talk more about this. Uh, you tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll continue our discussion in a moment. But first, some basketball legends are helping to fight the deadly coronavirus and spread awareness. Take a look. Hey everyone, this is Lou Deng, the ambassador of Basketball Africa League. Now, washing your hands has always been important, but never been as more important as now. What I like to do is turn the tap on, get your head a little bit wet, turn the tap off. Put the soap in your hand while the tap is off. Start washing your hands. Make sure you get between your fingers, get your wrist, and get the other side of your hand, right? Keep washing your hand. Make sure your hand is as clean as it can be. We want to wash our hand for 20 to 30 seconds, right? Turn your tap back on. So you wash your hands, get in your wrist, and get in your hand. Now, the most important part, when you finish washing your hands, make sure you turn the tap off with your elbow. After you turn the tap off, let your hands dry or use a paper towel. All right? Be safe, everyone. Hi, everyone. It's Taco Fall. I just wanted to say that now's the time to practice kindness and uh, empathy towards everyone around you. Um, we all doing our best to get to this together, so make sure you do your part. Grab a book, read it to your nieces and nephews on video chat, uh, make a donation of canned goods to your local food bank, or even add some items to your shopping cart for your elderly neighbors. But most importantly, don't forget to just pick up the phone and call somebody and check in. That may mean a lot. You never know. We all can be next to each other right now, but we still can show how much we care about one another. So visit mbatogether.com and join us in inspiring acts of caring. Thank you. Welcome back. You are watching a special edition of Straight Talk Africa on the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. From Durban in South Africa, we are joined by Dr. Salim Abdul Karim, epidemiologist and director of the Center for the AIDS Program of Research in South Africa, Caprisa. From New York City, we are joined by Dr. Sion Firu, Director of Emergency Medicine and Advisor to Ethiopia's Minister of Health on Emergency Care and Strategic Partnership. In Abuja, Nigeria, we have Dr. Ibrahim Abubakar Khana, Director and National Program Manager for Saving One Million Lives Program for Results, a World Bank-funded project in Nigeria's Federal Ministry of Health. And also joining us from Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso, is Dr. Mumuni Nyaone, executive of Pool for Progress, Burkina Faso, and a behavioral social health specialist. We have another question uh, from Lagos. Let's take a look. The doctors uh, um, are, li are liable to, you know, contact this d disease easily. Um, the question is, how do you prevent yourself and to be able to treat others? Dr. Nyaone, let me give you this question. Uh, what do you tell communities in terms of preventing coronavirus? Uh, uh, in our communities, uh, I, the first thing is to tell them that uh, some people may have a virus that don't show the signs. So need to know that and that 
the things you have to do is social distancing. You have to keep yourself at least to one meter to other people. You have to uh, wash your hand regularly with soap or hand sanitizer. Your hand, hands are clean so you can keep yourself safe. That's the basic information we give them. And we also tell them what are the different symptoms of this disease so they can call the number, phone number that, that is provided uh, by the government, of, uh, by, by the Minister of Health to get uh, help. Okay. So, yeah. All right. The and Dr. Mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, Salim, we talk about social distancing as an important measure uh, in uh, preventing or, or curbing the, the incidence of uh, COVID-19. How realistic is it in the African context? We saw that in South Africa, uh, uh, the, there was a uh, police was deployed to help for people to respect a social distancing, quarantine, and, and lockdown measures. So, how realistic is it? Social distancing is a key component, together with hand washing, of the strategies that almost all countries have undertaken, certainly here in South Africa as well. In most of our urban settings, it's been uh, implemented in a very structured way. For example, if you go to the shop to try and buy groceries, they have little lines on the, on the floor that you have to follow in order to maintain the one and a half meter distance. The challenge comes about when we go to our informal settlements, and we have several million individuals living in informal settlements, and their social distancing is not really practical. And so that's where our big concern is that the, the virus may be spreading in those kinds of settings just because we're not able to implement one of the most fundamental prevention strategies or social distancing in those settings. In Nigeria, Dr. Kana, how do you implement social distancing? What do you do with uh, people that live in crowded uh, areas, crowded uh, homes? What do you do in places where uh, people get in public transportation? What do you do with the woman who has to sell her donut in the morning so she can buy food for her kids at night? How do you implement social distancing in settings such as this? Certainly, Nigeria cannot be different from what Dr. Salim described about South Africa. However, what the government has done in Nigeria, looking into the reality that truly people have to come out, there are people who survive on daily pay jobs, you know, and um, if you don't take serious measure, certainly those people will have to come out in order to earn a living. So what government has done now, more or less, is to, one, close down all the schools in the Federation, from primary schools, secondary schools, and all the universities. Therefore, everybody's at home. Secondly, government has actually declared a lockdown hinging on the quarantine law of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Everybody must stay at home. Now, what it means is that everybody must be at home. Therefore, one, we have eliminated buses, we have eliminated trains. People will not have to crumple up inside buses or trains. However, in considering the fact that people have to eat, therefore, markets must remain open. What government has done now is to only allow markets that sell food items to only open at specific times of the day and of the week. However, any market that sells anything outside of food, they are under lock and key. If that has not been easy. Therefore, government has mobilized the entire security forces. If it means what government has done now is to apply pressure, you know, because the reality is that it is better for the government at the moment to apply force in whatever way than to allow coronavirus to continue to transmit or to spread in the community. We recognize the fact that there are slums in Nigeria, people live in crowded houses in some communities. The easiest thing for us to do now, and which is exactly what government is doing, is by producing large numbers of information, education, and communication materials in the form of radio jingles, video advert, uh, television adverts, flyers, and so many, even town criers, community leaders, religious leaders, have been engaging people in the community. Okay. Now, you'd be shocked to see that even people in those rural communities where, quote unquote, somebody can call a slum, that people come together a lot of times, they are unaware. Look, yes. No Nigerian wants to die. Therefore, they are also applying all the measures as far as social distancing is concerned. Certainly, we're not there. Certainly, we're not getting it perfect, but we're on track. Okay. And, and there is a lot are, more to be done. All Nigerians to, yes. Yeah, but also appealing to the people to understand the situation that it is not going to last for long, 
if we don't obey the rules, then it will last longer than we are facing at the moment. Okay. And the people are giving us full support, actually. Okay, thank you. Let's look at treatment now. We received this question on Facebook. Uh, Christoph Yoka in the Democratic Republic of Congo writes, we are learning that the chloroquine is widely advised to cure COVID-19. Is that medicine the same that was used against malaria and declared harmful? And how can we use it to heal from the new coronavirus? Uh, Dr. Salim, tell us about chloroquine. It's been in the news for various reasons. Is chloroquine used uh, at the moment to treat uh, patients? And if yes, how so? It started when chloroquine was first used in patients in China as a potential immune modulator. So chloroquine doesn't have an effect directly on viruses. And in this particular virus, there's some conflicting evidence as to whether it acts on the virus. But it's thought to act more on the immune response. And so you don't get the severe effect, or so it is claimed. However, it should be pointed out that chloroquine was used and created initially as part of a program to treat malaria. It's no longer used for malaria because malaria is now resistant to chloroquine. It was never an unsafe drug, it was always safe. The challenge now with COVID-19 is that there is no evidence to suggest that chloroquine is effective against this particular virus. There are two studies, one from France, which didn't have a control group, but there was a more definitive study of 62 patients from China, which showed that chloroquine didn't really have any significant benefits. So right now, the evidence is weak that chloroquine would be beneficial, but unfortunately, people are desperate. People want to use any treatment, whether it's actually proven or not. And so in South Africa, for example, there was a run on chloroquine that was available. Chloroquine is available in South Africa for other diseases, not for malaria. And it is now impossible to get hold of chloroquine because people are now hoarding it because they think it works. However, yeah. the evidence is not there. And chloroquine is used for rheumatoid uh, and also lupus. Uh, now, Dr. Nyaone, let me come to you. Chloroquine, is it used in, in your country, in Burkina Faso? Because there are some doctors that are using it uh, at the present time. Yeah, uh, so now the government has decided to, to use it for, the, for people. And we have two, uh, two uh, trials, clinical trials, that are willing to use it. So the one is using chloroquine, and another is trying to use uh, a medicine from traditional healers, so from Benin. It's called apivirin. But we, as he said, we don't have any evidence so far to say that chloroquine can treat people. So we will wait for the different studies to confirm or infirm that uh, chloroquine can work. And as experts say, uh, self-medication is really not advised, and they advise against self-medication because we've seen a lot of people going to pharmacies, markets, to buy chloroquine and uh, self-medicate, and uh, experts yeah, uh, strongly advise against that. Dr. Sion, uh, when a family uh, in a household have someone with a case of COVID-19, what measures should they take in that home to ensure that other people don't get infected? Okay, and again, I wanna, before I answer that question, I wanna reiterate because it depends on where you are again, especially in most of the African countries where they're uh, isolating inside a health institution, the practices might be different, but in places where, um, the government and the ministries are issuing an order to stay at home for mild symptoms or for people that are um, that have or diagnosed with COVID. Then uh, it's very important, which is what we're doing here in New York, where if you have mild symptoms, to stay at home. So the necessary measures are to ensure that people stay isolated from family members, meaning no hand contact. And as one of our colleagues told us that. This uh, virus can stay on cardboards and iron for a few hours up to days. So it's very important that people sanitize um, the hand knobs and not share common places, and if possible, even avoid using the same bathroom and definitely separate rooms. And to keep that distance of two meters or six feet is very, very important, and to ensure that 
uh, people are not engaged uh, in any kind of um, touching and not sharing plates and that especially the person who has this disease should not be preparing meals for the family and those things so it's important that they stay isolated and when they're talking to them especially the symptomatic people could have the virus coming out of a droplet from their mouth so it's recommended to wear a mask for the symptomatic ones and now there's new data it's not showing that it's airborne but to also for other people to wear masks where um, there's a rampant spread of communities, uh, spread of the disease. So it's important that they stay away from the disease or from the person that has the symptoms and make sure that hand washing strategies um, and avoid touching faces and eyes and to really be very vigilant of those things. Like people are very unaware and they could be touching their glasses, just their eyeglasses and their hair and their clothes. So it's very, very important to be very vigilant about these things and to ensure that you heed the advice of all the healthcare professionals, wherever they might be. All right, let's go to another question from a viewer. So my question to the doctors is this. Um, it is rumored that in areas with warmer climates, like in Africa and Kenya, the spread of coronavirus is quite slow. So I'd like to know whether this is true or false. And also, as we are approaching the rainy seasons, which are about to start in April, um, should we expect to see an increase in the number of coronavirus cases in Kenya since the climate will be a bit cooler? There have been uh, many rumors and many myths and misinformation out there on social media, uh, including social media. What do we know in terms of uh, the warm weather or even the heat and coronavirus. Uh, Dr. Karim, do we know anything specific? Yes, we know quite a bit. So the virus itself uh, grows and comfortably survives at 37 degrees Celsius, which is our normal body temperature. So in most warm settings, the virus should not have any difficulty in surviving. There's a bigger issue as to whether it can survive cold temperatures and there, studies have shown that even as low as 5 degrees Celsius, that the virus does survive. So the, the rumors that went around that, you know, we should just wait for our summer and that will take care of this problem, I'm sad to say, is simply not true. Mm -hmm. There are also a be belief that, uh, there is a belief that uh, you can uh, catch coronavirus by yeah. handling money. Is this true, uh, Dr. Salim? Yes, it is true because the virus can survive on paper. And it survives not for a very long time, but for a few hours. And so uh, paper is one mechanism by which it can be transmitted. So what should people do when they are handling money? Well, it's, uh, it goes without saying, you know, we've got to hand sanitize, we've got to use alcohol-based uh, uh, sprays to maintain our uh, hand hygiene, wash our hands. And every time you handle money, you should use some sanitizer or wash your hands. Dr. Nyaone, the myth and misinformation are something that grow in communities. We see that uh, very often. We've seen it in the case of Ebola, where a community uh, had some certain beliefs that uh, led to community mistrust. Uh, towards uh, health providers. Uh, talk to us about uh, uh, one of the myths that uh, you are working on in terms of uh, dispelling it and educating uh, the, peop the, the mass population uh, to, to get the right information. So one of the major uh, myths we have here is that uh, only rich people uh, get a coronavirus. So, and unfortunately, the first cases uh, started from the government people and uh, rich. But we assume they are rich because they can use plane to travel. So, for example, the first person who died in Burkina is uh, an, a lady who works in, with, uh, uh, I, I forgot the, the name of the place. Oh, yes, that's, so that's okay. She's, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, in, so in the in the uh, in our communities, the, our effort now is to show people it's not only rich people who can get the disease. It's not only higher society people who can get it. 
And so we are working on the on telling them how the disease is spread, spread and how they can prevent it from like they can prevent it by washing their hands, by using masks, and by be, uh, respecting the different uh, uh, rules of social distancing. All so right. the main idea of rich people getting uh, the disease is the, one of the major things. But we also have people who believe that uh, fluorokine can treat the disease. So this is one of the problems we also have. And, uh, yes, and Dr. Karim uh, clearly explained that earlier. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nyaone. Dr. Kana, in Nigeria, uh, can you tell us about one myth or misinformation that you would like to uh, perhaps um, correct? Well, uh, the number one misinformation, really, people think that this is the disease of the, of the rich. You yes. know, because if you go to, quote-unquote, the relatively poor community, they say, no, this, this is the disease of the rich people. You know, paradoxically, or rather incidentally, of all the diseases that have come into the world, coronavirus seems to be the number one condition that are actually started affecting or infecting people of affluence. You know, in the past, like most other diseases, like HIV, tuberculosis, and measles, and other childhood diseases, they usually affect mainly poor people. But for the first time, in fact, even last fever that we have in that we still have in Nigeria affects largely poor people. But till date, most of the people that have been infected, or rather present with signs and symptoms of coronavirus, actually are people who have traveled abroad or who had contact with those that returned from abroad. Therefore, people, ordinary people in Nigeria, which incidentally constitute over 50 percent of the population in the country, will say, "Look, I have no relation of anybody that traveled abroad. I don't know anybody that ever traveled abroad, and therefore I am safe." You know, but that is the myth. The reality is that in the houses of the wealthy people, we have drivers, we have cooks, we have gardeners. These are people of low socioeconomic status. They okay. mingle directly with the people of affluence. And where do they live? They go back to the local communities and the quote and unquote slums. And there, they can actually transmit the infection. And that is our major concern. And that's why we're talking to people in rural communities that, look, this is not a disease of the rich. This okay. disease does not respect whether the rich or the poor. It is clear or, at, uh, rather, at this point. Give somebody in the yes, of thank you, Dr. Kana. Dr. Salim, I would like you to react to something that happened recently in the news where two French uh, uh, doctors were talking about uh, testing uh, a potential uh, vaccine, BCG, uh, for prevention of coronavirus. And uh, the comment really created a, 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 big, a big controversy because uh, one of them was suggesting to go to Africa. You had uh, research in the University of KwaZulu-Natal. You're also an expert in tuberculosis. Uh, can I have your reaction to this and also the fact that community mistrust can, be, can come from uh, experiences such as this one? What is your reaction? So the study that was done was what we call an ecological study. They looked at countries that have advanced epidemics and countries that don't. And what they show in this analysis is that countries who do not have a universal BCG vaccination, that they have the most advanced epidemics. However, that analysis is simply flawed. It doesn't make sense because you cannot compare a country where the virus entered three months later than another one and say that, oh, well, this country doesn't have this epidemic because they have BCG. Simply put, Africa yet hasn't yet seen the full growth of the epidemic and its full impact like they've seen in New York. What this analysis needs to do, it needs, it's premature. If this analysis will need to be done in about four to six months from now, where all countries have had the full-blown epidemic, and then we can compare whether those that have had BCG policies that introduced it as universal vaccination had any better outcomes than those who didn't. And it's also flawed because in the countries where this virus is spreading, whether you've had BCG or not, you have an equal chance of getting this virus. So it doesn't make sense at this point. Okay. Dr. Sion, when you look at the way the epidemic is progressing in your country, but in Africa as a whole, what is your message? 
So I know it's very difficult times. And I think like most of my colleagues has alluded to, people are not taking us seriously, thinking that this is a disease of the rich or as a disease of the white or the Westerns. I really do hope that uh, we have um, a shift in how we think in Africa. This is the window of opportunity we have. Knowing the lack of resources in Africa, prevention is the best strategy and the most effective strategy that we have. So it's very important that people do uh, listen to the advices of their officials. Just like the saying goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of a cure. And the most effective thing that we have for Africa right now is prevention and to make sure that we don't have the spread of the disease like we do in New York and in Europe because we don't have the system. The, and also the health, our health system is not going to be able to withstand this amount of people and people dying. So when it comes to the idea of this flattening the curve, Let's not even get to that level when okay. we are still very plateau and with the low cases that we have, we should definitely keep it at that and prevent the spread of the disease because when it spreads, it spreads like a wildfire. Okay. And uh, Dr. Kana, very briefly, uh, what is your message? Well, first of all, we, uh, for everybody in Nigeria and Africa in general to accept the fact that this is a global disease, it is a pandemic. It is not only peculiar to Europe or America, it is peculiar to everybody around the world. We should pray to God Almighty while obeying and listening to exactly the instructions given by government officials in okay. each of our countries. Because okay. this is not the time for us to violate rules and regulations. And okay. we pray to God Almighty that this disease should remain the way it is and not to progress further in Africa. Thank you, Dr. Kana. Dr. Nyaone, briefly, your message? Yes, my message is that it's... Uh, it's extremely important to engage the communities because when you sit in your off desk and decide for the communities, they will not follow. So we should use intervention driven by social and behavioral change theories. We should use evidence and we should uh, contextualize our inform uh, interventions using inputs from communities. So okay. my message is to our community leader to the country leaders to involve the communities in the intervention. All right, Dr. Nyaone, thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Firu, Dr. Karim, Dr. Kana, thank you for being on our special edition of Straight Talk Africa. We appreciate your time. Thanks to all of you for watching and participating with your questions and comments. Thanks to our audience for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. And a special thanks to all the frontline workers, doctors, nurses, cleaning crew, and others for your work and dedication in this difficult time. You are real heroes. I'm your host, Lina Mudu. Until next time, stay safe, wash your hands often, and strive to make every day a healthy day.